Hello, I'm Joel Kramer, and um, I'm an archaeology student here in Israel. How are you so crazy about me? You gave your life to set me free. By your grace that I had never known, I am saved, my life is yours alone. Ba -da 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 -da. Northern Kingdom that I would consider the most important it would be Shechem because it's mentioned so many times in the Bible uh, we were at Bethel the other day it's actually the second most mentioned city in the Bible outside of Jerusalem but um, Shechem you have so much history and so many stories associated with this place so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take it kind of chronologically and talk through uh, and talk through all the things that have happened here. This is the retaining wall that was made in the Middle Bronze period where, uh, where this stone wall was built all the way around the city and the inside of it was filled in. And then you had what kind of wall on top of the stone retaining wall? Mud brick. Mud brick. And when it's excavated, then it exposes uh, however much is uh, still there. And you can see on top of the gate over here, you can see what a normal mud brick wall looks like when it's excavated and then left exposed to the elements for a long period of time it just eventually totally disappears but it just turns into this blob of mud brick that's not what was found at Jericho what was found at Jericho was a collapsed wall collapsed out on the outside of the city which we saw but you can see um, that from one site to another in this particular period you're not talking about totally different things you're talking about these cities were built in the same ways. And again, you can see some of the, the mud bricks are preserved here. You can see it's almost completely gone on the other side of the gate, the remnant of the mud brick wall. I mean, like we were talking about at Jericho, we're on this <laughs> side of the uh, green line. Um, and, uh, and so the schools that are involved in projects like the one here are completely full of mud and um, a lot of it has to do with propaganda a lot of it is politically driven and so on and so forth so anyways um, these are the middle bronze walls uh, just like when we were in uh, J uh, Jericho remember you could see how the city was bigger and then it became smaller in order to be built higher and be more defensible so this is the west gate that you, I mean the east facing gate right down in front of us and if you look out outside of the gate you can see the remains from the older part of the city when Shechem was bigger than uh, when they made these middle bronze walls. Everybody see that? Um, you can see these unique gates are, uh, are, had a sliding gate that slid in between those stones. You see that? very interesting and then if you were able to break through the first one then you came into this killing zone here and you had to break through a second one down here okay so this is the city at the time of the patriarchs okay remember we talked about uh, Abraham generally roughly uh, is given the biblical chronology date of 2000 BC and this is uh, where early bronze which is to middle bronze okay so um, I'm going to read out of Genesis chapter 12. This is when the biblical story first comes into this land. G Genesis 12. This is be right before he moves to where we were a few days ago um, between Bethel and I. Okay, so verse 6. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At, the, uh, at that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So this is the first place that Abram, not yet having his name changed to Abraham, Abram is first mentioned in the land right here at Shechem. 
and he builds an altar to Yahweh and worships. Um, okay, so then we move to chapter 33 of Genesis. After Jacob came from Padanaram, that's where he got his uh, wives and came back into the land, he arrived safely at the city of Shechem in Canaan and camped within sight of the city. For a hundred pieces of silver he bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, the plot of ground where he pitched his tent. Any ideas where that might be? It's been almost 4,000 years. Any idea where he might have bought land and pitched his tent? Maybe right there where we just were. Where he dug a well that's preserved for us because we know where Jesus and the Samaritan woman had their conversation with the well. And what did they say in their conversation? They call it Jacob's well. Okay, so is that within sight of the city? Yes. Is it a well that's associated with Jacob? Yes. Does it mean that's for sure where his camp was? Um, no. But uh, it's, a, it, it's a pretty good indicator. The red dome? The red dome, yes. Yeah. That's where the well was. That's where the well was. And by the way, if you see this green dome over here from this mosque with the minaret, that's where uh, the village of Sikar in the Roman per period goes up the side of that hill over there. And we'll talk about that um, a little bit later. Moving from the time of the patriarchs to the time of Joshua and the conquest. Um, this is where the covenant is renewed. And um, it's very interesting because we have um, way back in the 1800s down in Amarna, Egypt, were found what are called the Amarna letters. And there's over 300 of them. There's these tablets that talk about, well, they argue about what time they come from, but they, they come from the general time period of when the Bible says the conquest happens. And, uh, and it's, they're, they're written from the kings of these Canaanite cities that are freaking out, and they're asking the Pharaoh for help against a people called the Hapiru. Um, now, if you go back to early scholarship, everybody associated the Hapiru with the Hebrews, both linguistically and historically. Okay, but then uh, as things became more and more secularized and more and more messed up, in my opinion, then this went out the window and now they say that the Hapiru don't have anything to do with anything. Uh, yeah, that's, that's crazy. If the Hapiru are not the Hebrews, then who the heck are they? And you have, to, you have to look at things from the big picture. We miss the forest for the trees. So if you look at the forest, everybody agrees. Roman will uh, attest. Everybody agrees with this. These were all Canaanite cities. Right, Roman? All these were Canaanite cities. Then something happened, and the next people to occupy them was the Israelites. So if the Israelites and their roots aren't the Hapiru, then who the heck are? And why wouldn't they be talking about the people that eventually take this land over and live here? Um, the only ancient, the, well, the ancient text says that's what happened. The archaeology says that's what happened. So what's the problem? The problem is the Bible says it, and so there's the battle against the Bible going on. But these Hapiru are all living in tents. Did you all, when you were up north, did you go to Hatsor? Think about Hatsor. It's the biggest tell in this country. It's huge. The guy, the king of Hatsor is writing the pharaoh in Egypt and going, Help! Help! There's all these people, they're living in tents, they're gonna, they're gonna conquer us, help, send troops. <laughs> and then, guess what happens to Hot Sore? <laughs> then guess who lives in Hot Sore after the end of Canaanite Hot Sore? The Israelites. This is not rocket science. This is simple. It's just that when you take God out of the picture, 
then it's like getting hit with a stupid stick. You can't figure anything out anymore because we need God in order to figure anything out, right? All we got to do in these sites to really get it is take the Bible and what it says about a place and then stand on the site and look what's been found here. Okay, so let's just do that. Um, I'm not going to read the whole uh, renewal of of the covenant, but let's just go through it. And by the way, the um, Armarna letters say this. Uh, Gezer, the king of Gezer, and, and they're writing and they say, they complain that the king of Shechem uh, falls in with the Hapiru. That he joins with the Hapiru. Well, isn't that interesting? Because in the conquest, they renew the covenant here and there is no mention of a battle that takes place here. It must have something to do with the earlier connection with the patriarchs and, uh, and, and what happened here uh, before that there's no battle. So again, that's an awful big coincidence if it's not connected to the history and to the biblical account. Okay, so what happened in the renewal of the covenant is uh, the Israelites were divided. Six tribes were on the side of that mountain, cover the side of Mount Gerizim with six tribes of Israelites. And then this is Mount Ebal. So cover with the other six tribes, uh, the whole side there of Mount Ebal, and they're shouting at each other. And from Mount Gerizim, they're shouting all the blessings that they'll receive as a people if they keep the law, if they keep the covenant. And from Mount Ebal, that six tribes are shouting all the curses that they'll receive if they break the law, the, the covenant with God. So you can imagine, and, and this is, by the way, if we didn't have the city here, we have early pilgrim accounts about how this acts as a, uh, a natural amphitheater, and you can kind of see it in the shape of where we're standing right now. So they're shouting at each other, the blessings and the curses, the blessings. If we keep the covenant, it's going to rain, and we're going to have great crops, and we're gonna, our animals are going to have milk and they're going to have young, and we're going to have children, and it's going to be wonderful. We're going to have, it's going to be great. And from the curses, if we break the covenant, then we're going to have no rain. It's going to be a drought, and our crops are going to fail, and our animals are going to fail, and uh, everything's going to become a heap of rubble. Okay? Now, they make this covenant, and at the end, in chapter 24, uh, Joshua says this, uh, he says this, uh, Now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your, fa for, uh, your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. We will serve, it's the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, we will serve Yahweh. Then the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our fathers up out of Egypt from the land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because He is our God. And Joshua said to the people, You are not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he, has been, uh, after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you, and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God and obey him. 
On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people. And there at Shechem, he drew up for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Now listen to this. Then he took a large stone. I'm going to read that again. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. That's the stone. And I'll explain when we get over there how we know that's the stone. Now that you can look at the stone, I'm going to read that again. Uh, and Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. None of us were here 3,500 years ago to hear the covenant renewed here, but that stone was. That stone heard every word. Now listen to this. That stone was discovered in the excavations here, and, uh, and, and then it was damaged by the workers that were working here when they realized, you know, how they were fitting this in, they actually started breaking it apart. It was found twice as preserved as what you see there. It wasn't completely intact, but it was twice as preserved as it, as it is today. It was found laying next to an original stone with a groove cut into it from which it fits into. When you go and you look around it, you're going to see modern cement and all this kind of stuff from them putting it in there and cementing it in. But if you look, uh, there's patches of the original rock that was found that's underneath there that has the groove in it. They know exactly where it was. And uh, there are pictures of it from when it was first found that of when it was more preserved than it is. We'll be convinced by the Bible that that's the stone when we get over there. Let's pretend that there was no such thing as the Bible. And we're just archaeologists and we've just uncovered this, uh, this building. Then we would have to try to interpret it, right? And, um, you know, we probably would interpret it as a temple because uh, it's got a standing stone in front of it. It's got a divider across here um, that separates out a holy place from a more holy of holies and so on and so forth. We, could, we would know that it was destroyed by fire because it was found um, with, uh, with destroyed by fire with the different floors that had collapsed down. It would puzzle us because I want you to come and look at this. This is the, this is the wall of a building. Um, and so we've got the inside of the wall right here. Look at this. It goes all the way out to here. That is huge. <laughs> that is a massive wall. Now, the general rule of thumb, because all you ever find in archaeology is the foundations of walls and buildings. You don't ever find the, you know, much more than that. So you judge how tall something is by how wide the walls are. So here's the reconstruction by the archaeologist, Ernest Wright. And he's got it, what, one, two, three, four stories high. Um, why does he have it four stories high? Because look how massive these walls are. Um, so, some put it even higher than that. Then, we would know that it was destroyed by fire because it collapsed down and they found the fire destruction, different floors that had collapsed down during the uh, excavation. Um, fortunately, Fortunately, we don't have to be limited that way. If, if we didn't have an ancient text, that's all we could say. That's all we would know. We wouldn't know anything else, no details, nothing about what was going on, nothing about who destroyed this place and why, 
No, no names of, of anything, but, unfor but fortunately, we have the biblical text that tells us about this building. So listen to this. This is uh, the story of Abimelech in Judges chapter 9. And uh, Abimelech is one of the sons of Gideon, and uh, he's the one that kills his 70 uh, brothers on a stone at Ophrah. Okay, and so Abimelech, Gideon, is, uh, got more than one wife, and the wife that uh, Abimelech is from, the, his mother is from Shechem. Okay, and uh, Abimelech is trying by killing his brothers to become the king. So it says this in uh, verse 6, it says, Then all the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo gathered beside the great tree at the pillar in Shechem to crown Abimelech king. Where is the pillar? Okay, now, this is what nails it. Um, they have a falling out between Abimelech and the people of Shechem. And uh, so this is uh, verse 46. On hearing this, the citizens in the tower of Shechem. Where is that? We're standing in it, right? Um, in other translations, it calls it the fortress temple, which is on the sign out here. This is the fortress temple. Why? Because of its fortification walls are so massive. Archaeologists did not know what a fortress temple was that the Bible was talking about here until they excavated here and uncovered the fortress temple, the Tower of Shechem that's talked about here. Again, if we just take one thing per site uh, that the Bible says about a site and then what it's found in the ground, uh, it becomes very clear. For Jericho, it says that a collapsed wall. What do they find archaeologically? A collapsed wall. For Shechem, uh, the one thing would be, it talks about a fortress temple. And what did they find when they excavated here? A fortress temple. Okay, so on hearing this, the citizens uh, in the tower of Shechem went into the stronghold of the temple, or the fortress temple, of, and then it gives us the name of this temple. You ready? El Burit. We know what the name of this temple is, El Barit. Do you know what that means in Hebrew? The Covenant. The name of this building with the stone in front of it, we're talking about from the Israelite period, not the Canaanite period. The name of this building is called the Covenant. That's why that stone is associated with the covenant that was made prior to that with Joshua and, uh, and, and the Israelites. You see what I'm getting at? I'm not just trying to be sensationalistic. Uh, it, it only makes sense. It's what this whole temple is highlighting is the standing stone in front of it. And if this is called the covenant, because this is where the covenant is renewed and they put up a standing stone as a witness to the covenant and this is called the covenant and that's in front of it. That's the stone. <laughs> okay. Uh, when Abimelech heard that they had assembled there in the fortress temple, uh, he and all his men uh, took axe and cut off some branches. I got to get glasses. I have them in my pocket, but yeah. <laughs> And cut off my, yeah, let me get them on real fast. Well, you can read that anyway. Yeah. yeah. Even with that. Good okay, here we go. Um, they took branches, which he lifted to his shoulders. He ordered the men with him, quick, do what you see me do. So all the men cut branches and followed Abimelech. They piled them against the stronghold and set it on fire over the people inside so that all the people in the tower of Shechem, about a thousand men and women, also died. Okay, so, by the way, that's how you burn down in antiquity these buildings that are made mostly of stone. They have wood in them, but if you're going to burn the temple in Jerusalem the same way, you're going to put wood up against it and inside of it and burn it that way. Um, 
Okay. So uh, let me say a few more things and then we can go over and look at the stone. We also have an important thing that happens here uh, later on after the judges period. Um, you're all familiar with the divided kingdom, right? Uh, the, the northern kingdom of Israel divides the ten tribes from the southern kingdom of Judah. That happens here at Shechem. Solomon's son, remember Solomon builds the uh, altars to his foreign wives on the hill just to the east of the city of David. And uh, God tells him, that's it. I'm tearing ten tribes away from you. It's going to happen in your son's reign. So Rehoboam is his son. He comes up here. He's giving a speech to try to get the ten tribes to uh, remain and, uh, loyal to him and, and follow him and serve him as king. And, uh, and so remember that he goes to two for advice on how his speech should be. One is the old men. What do the old men tell him? Be nice. Be nice. Be nicer than your father. And they'll follow you. And then he goes to the young men. What do the young men say? What young men usually say? They say, no! Be mean! You gotta be really mean. You gotta be meaner than your father. You gotta tell them that you're gonna whip their backs with scorpion tails. <laughs> right? So, what, who does he listen to? The young men. He comes back. He gives them the fiery whip your backs with uh, scorpion tails and they, uh, they reject him as king. He has to flee in his chariot back to Jerusalem from here, and that is the divided kingdom. The first king, Jeroboam, sets up his capital right here at Shechem, and then he sets up two worship centers so that uh, the people won't revert back to uh, the worship in Jerusalem. So he builds a worship center with a golden calf up at Dan in the far north of the northern kingdom and at Bethel, where we were the other day, in the far south of the kingdom. And uh, so this is where the kingdom divides. And then uh, you have this as part of the history up into uh, the Assyrian time period where Samaritans are living here. Um, this in between the Testament periods, during the Greek period, the Hellenistic period, um, when the, the Hasmoneans, are you familiar with the, who the Hasmoneans are? The Hasmoneans are the Jews that win their independence in Jerusalem and they take from the Seleucids, take control of Jerusalem, and they, uh, they gain their independence for a little over a hundred years. This is called the Hasmoneans, okay? Uh, one of their kings, one of their rulers, is a guy named John Harkanus. And uh, after they'd held uh, Jerusalem, then they start expanding. The Hasmonean kingdom starts expanding to the south and to the north. John Harkanus comes up here and conquers this area uh, from the Samaritans. Now, the Samaritans had their worship place up on top of Mount Gerizim. In fact, if you look over to the left there, you see a building sticking up uh, in that bald area up there. That's an Islamic period building that is sitting on top of a Byzantine church, which is sitting on top of the Samaritan temple, which was built at the time, somewhere roughly around the time of Nehemiah, because, um, because the archaeology dates it to that time period. So it looks like Sanballat, who uh, we read about in that story, who's the leader of the Sumerians, when he's not uh, allowed to build in uh, the temple in Jerusalem, it looks like the Samaritans come up and build their temple up on top of Mount Gerizim. The Samaritans to this day live up on top of Mount Gerizim, and they only hold to the five books of Moses. Um, and they have their own paper trail for, uh, for the Torah, for the, um, the Samaritan Pentateuch, it's called. And it's one of the things that are used in order to do um, comparisons of these ancient copies that we have. So it's very important. It's only changed in a few places. And those few places are where God says, in the future I will choose a place, right? It says, uh, no, it's Mount Gerizim. He chose Mount Gerizim. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so anyways, they only hold to the five books of Moses. Same 2,000 years ago. John Harkanus came up here. He destroyed the temple. 
and he destroyed Shechem. At the time, Shechem got its water supply from springs in an aqueduct. Aqueducts come along in the Hellenistic period from Mount Gerizim that fed the city of Shechem. There's two ways that you can destroy a city. You can just destroy it or you can destroy it in such a thorough way so that it won't be inhabited again. That's what John Harkanus did. He destroyed the aqueduct system, just completely destroyed the water system for Shechem and so it wasn't rebuilt again. So now, fast forward to uh, the time of Jesus. You can barely see, uh, I think, the, the church that we are at sticking up over, over here. So you've got it over there. Remember the story. Jesus uh, is traveling to the Galilee, he stops here at noon for a drink of water. Here comes the Samaritan woman and he asks her for a drink and she's very surprised. Why? Because the story tells us that Jews do not have dealings with Samaritans. Why did the Samaritans and the Jews not get along? Well, John Harkanus, who was Jewish, destroyed their temple and their city and their aqueduct system. So, for the, so, so who the Romans or the Babylonians and the Romans are to the Jews, the Jews were to the Samaritans. They didn't get along. Bad blood. Okay, so this place, when Jesus and the Samaritan woman are having their conversation down here, this is in ruins. Shechem is already in ruins. The temple up on Mount Gerizim is already in ruins. And where does the conversation go? Uh, Jesus, uh, the, the Samaritan woman says, Oh, uh, our forefathers say that this is the mountain that we should worship on. Whereas you Jews say it's uh, the mountain down in Jerusalem, right? Mount Moriah. And what does Jesus say to her? He says, the time is here now, meaning I'm here now, where it's not going to be about this mountain. It's not going to be about that mountain. It's going to be about Jesus himself and that the true worshiper of the Father worships in spirit and truth. And so the historical context of this place is truly amazing that, that brings that story in its context to light. So everywhere from Abraham all the way to uh, Jesus, we have biblical stories and history taking place here at Shechem. Um, well, it's about twice that big. Um, if we go to Gezer, we have standing stones there that, uh, that you can see that are generally the same size that this would have been. Da, 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 da.